In this video, we're going to be talking about anomaly detection. So as data points grow and technology progresses, the speed of data collection accelerates, forcing organizations to monitor, analyze, and process data at unprecedented rates. With such an increase in data comes the challenge of monitoring for unwanted or unexpected events. One method to combat this concern is to use outlier analysis. This is a process involving machine learning to adapt to standard patterns and monitor for anomalies in the patterns, flagging them for review or action. So when we talk about learning patterns and looking for outliers, we need to consider what is a normal pattern. So for example, a spike in sales on Black Friday would be expected for most e-commerce sites, and not seeing that traffic increase would be indicative of a deviation from the expected value. So anomaly detection can also be used as an indicator of a critical incident occurring, like a distributed denial of service attack, or an unusual quantity of water flowing along one pipe that indicates to a utility company that a rupture has occurred. At a fundamental level, anomaly detection is simple, analyzing data that has been captured over time and identifying any unusual changes. The more data that is presented to the machine learning algorithm, the more accurate the detection rates will be. So the longer the monitored time elapsed, the better the anomaly detection will get. Now, from an alternative perspective, anomaly detection can be used in a positive manner, as well as finding problems. It can be used to detect subtle changes in consumer behavior so that a company may react to drive sales. It can also be used to identify rare items or observations that differ from the normal data. Take space exploration as an example, where a subtle shift in the light spectrum could indicate a black hole forming or a star going supernova. Now, at a high level, an anomaly is an event that does not conform to the standard pattern of behavior and can be indicative of either a positive or negative event. So there are three types of anomalies. We'll start talking about the first. So the first is a point anomaly, which is where an individual metric or instance of a data within the set has a significant variance to the range of the rest of the collected data. The second is a contextual anomaly, where the anomalous data taken as a standalone event could be perceived as a normal variance, but when put into context, shows as unexpected. And the third is a collective anomaly where normal values are present in the data, but it is an anomaly based on the collection of the data. So this can be broken down into two variations. The first being when events happen in an unexpected order. And secondly, where there are value combinations from two data points that may seem within range but should not correlate together. So an anomaly is a change to business as usual. And because business, as usual, fluctuates and moves, anomalies need to be understood as deviations from the expected behavior and not just a metric that extends beyond the boundaries of an arbitrary threshold. Now, unsupervised anomaly detection systems learn over time what the normal behaviors are, then use statistical testing to determine anomalous data points within the series. Normal behavior is determined by the majority of the data values and ranges within the set, and anomalies determined by least fit to the dynamic thresholds and system calculations. Now, supervised anomaly detection systems use training by example. So, a person or a mechanism continuously provides the system data sets that act as examples of already categorized values. The detection system builds its quote, normal from these categories, and functions by categorizing new data based on the categories it has learned. So supervised machine learning algorithms have a shortfall. Though. Because it can only work to the boundaries of the categories, it has already learned. It cannot work with data that falls outside of the categories that has been provided examples of. Now, semi-supervised anomaly detection utilizes unsupervised models that can incorporate input manually entered from an external source, allowing anomalies to be pre-programmed and false positives identified 
to be ignored. Anomaly detection is an improvement over monitoring. A monitor will determine an outcome based on a set threshold, like an alert from an SNMP monitoring system letting the operator know the server is consuming above 75% of its available RAM. Anomaly detection will learn that when a scheduled task runs, it will always consume a high amount of RAM, and this is considered a normal or expected fluctuation. So when the values in a time series spike outside the threshold but are expected based on repeated past behavior, there would be no alert. However, if there is a value outside of both the normal and the expected range, where normal is defined by the majority of time, and expected being an expected fluctuation, then an alert will be raised to an anomalous event. Anomaly detection in practice is used in many varied situations and industries, from IT to medical to construction and scientific. Let's now discuss some real-world uses where we might see it in action. So most of the popular cloud platforms include some form of threat analysis service. These frequently use anomaly detection to identify attacks at the network layer through learning standard traffic patterns and monitoring for abnormal behaviors or unaccounted increases in traffic. So equipment failures can be both predicted and identified through anomaly detection systems, providing data of equipment failure, runtime, where factors, environmental factors, and any other related data can help to find patterns and failures and determine when a failure has an anomaly or an expected event. Anomaly detection is commonly used by financial institutions to detect fraudulent activities where uncommon sums of money are exchanged or abnormal spending habits suddenly develop. Cheating in games can be used for financial gain like using bots to mine for, say, precious resources in MMOs or controlling player characters for rewards. Anomaly detection can be used to determine a game's patterns and find where abnormal character attributes can lead towards either hacks being involved by the player or bots being used to farm for financial rewards. Glitches in pricing on e-commerce sites have been responsible for multiple high-profile issues with steep discounts on items or null pricing causing automated systems to process orders at significant cost to the business. Anomaly detection can help to identify spending behaviors as they occur, rather than using a traditional BI approach to narrow down where the error lay. In this video, we're going to talk about challenges of anomaly detection. Now, Anomaly detection is utilizing data from the past to determine issues in the present. This can bring challenges as usage and patterns evolve, fundamentally altering the pattern away from historical records. So the machine learning algorithm used in anomaly detection must be capable of adapting to changes in behavior as part of learning what business as usual means. Retailers will see a spike in sales on Black Friday this is expected behavior and should be taken into consideration. However, a monitoring system that operates within thresholds would alert that this increase in traffic exceeds those defined values. This is a highlight of utilizing machine learning to understand and expect the pattern rather than simply setting alerts on minimum and maximum thresholds. Time series captured by anomaly detection systems can be used to provide educated guesses on the potential for upcoming events, helping organizations to plan for customer satisfaction. Now, when training an anomaly detection system, variables can be used to either keep the scope narrow or increase the scope of the collection to provide a collective vision into the monitored environment. A multi-variable system will utilize multiple metrics and correlate them together to determine an overall view of the health of whatever is being monitored. When multiple data points are gathered but are retained in isolation, the system will ignore correlations or cause and effect situations, so metrics must be gathered in parallel. 
Single variable anomaly detectors are more vulnerable to outliers than a multivariable system because both the mean and subsequently the standard deviation of the metric being monitored get calculated over the time series window. So any anomalies that happen after an outlier could be categorized as normal. Any anomaly detection system is only as good as the data it receives. The system must be trained before implementation for it to functionally perform its job. For optimal results, data used for training must be clean and free of faults, but this can bring its own set of challenges to overcome. So unlabeled data creates information that is either wasted or wasteful. Wasted data are metrics or values that could be relevant to training an efficient model, but are unused because they are not labeled, and as such, the detector cannot categorize them. Wasteful data is when it provides information that is not useful to the model, but still affects it in some way, or just adds to the noise without providing any usable feature. So if data used for training already contains anomalies, the anomaly detection model may include these within its mean and standard deviation calculations, affecting the reliability of the model at detecting new anomalies. Not enough data will result in a system that is unable to accurately predict or determine what an anomaly is because the mean is not broad enough. This will usually result in an excess of false positives. And if the data is not time series based, the mean and standard deviation are difficult to calculate. There is no linear pattern to work from and correlations to frequencies cannot be determined. So to work around this, data must be structured in a way to bring a context to the findings. In statistics, an outlier is an observation that is at an abnormal distance from the rest of the values in a random sample. So in anomaly detection, there are three types of outliers. So global outliers, also known as point anomalies, are significant events where the value of the deviation is extremely far beyond any other points within the data set. So if a traffic monitor were set to analyze the vehicles on a certain stretch of highway, then motorcycles, cars, and transport trucks would be normal data within potential for variance in the relative quantities of each. However, a helicopter touching down on the stretch of road would be an unusual occurrence. It would generate a global outlier event to be logged and triggered. Now, the second type is a contextual outlier, which is where a data point's value deviates from the normal pattern, but its deviation, when taken into context, is not abnormal. So coming back to our traffic counter example, rush hour would result in an increase in the number of cars traversing the monitored stretch of highway. This increase in the number of cars would usually warrant a flag of abnormal behavior. However, in context, the number of motorcycles and transport trucks increased commensurately, showing that the traffic volume increased, but just the number of cars. The third type of outlier is a collective anomaly. So in this sense, collective refers to multiple time series where none of them could be exhibiting abnormal behavior. However, combined, they paint a picture of an anomaly that would not have been detected using only one data set. Congestion occurs on a highway to a peak in the number of vehicles may not cause an anomaly to be detected, but overlay another monitor from a different stretch of road that showed a significant decrease in traffic, and you may determine that there is a traffic event causing traffic to follow a different route. Challenges encountered by operators looking to implement an anomaly detection system can often be apparent at the outset of the implementation. Presumably, most implementations are due to either a new system emerging that requires monitoring, or a system that has grown to an extent that monitoring manually is not feasible anymore. In the case of the former, the amount of data available to train the model may be limited, causing frequent false positives until such time as enough data has become available that the system is able to determine the true outliers. Data sets are also frequently imbalanced, where there are either not enough outliers included, or there are too many, and so they become expected behavior. 
Detectors built on dynamic systems that are growing rapidly may encounter issues in identifying rapid changes as expected behavior and could be prone to false positive as the monitored environment grows. The reality of anomaly detection using artificial intelligence is that it will never be a perfect system. So unexpected bursts in activity may not always be malicious or a consequence of a fault, but may be coincidental or driven by factors beyond the control of the provider. And false positives and false negatives are always going to be present in any anomaly detection, and there will be trade-offs between the two that the business will have to accept. And root cause analysis provided by anomaly detectors will always be limited to only what inputs they have received. As such, it will fall on the business or the operator to apply their own domain knowledge in some instances to understand the information presented by the AI. In this video, we're going to talk about Azure Anomaly Detector Cognitive Services. So Microsoft Anomaly Detector is a new offering available on the Azure Cloud Platform for providing anomaly detection capabilities for time series data sets. It uses an interface engine to automatically assess the data set to determine the algorithm to use for the machine learning, removing the need to be a data scientist from the developer's workload. It's an automatic detection system removes the need for the organization to spend time labeling the data set. So instead, it can determine the data's composure and automatically sort and categorize it in a meaningful way. Now, by offering a configurable model, the anomaly detection service allows the business to set its own sensitivities for determining anomalies based on what the organization considers its risk profile to be. So Azure Anomaly Detector can work in real time, monitoring data through its API or a client library as it gets created. It can also be used against historical data, meaning it is not only a live detector, but also a tracer to determine where and when issues occurred in the past, helping with root cause analysis scenarios. Anomaly Detector can be used to track trends within data sets, helping organizations to organically move with customer demands and adaptively altering the detector to understand changing behaviors. Now, data sent to anomaly detector accepts data in JSON request objects, and they can be any numerical data in a sequence. So at the minimum, you can send 12 data points with a maximum of 8,640. So if there is no clear pattern, then there should be at least four occurring patterns and no more than 10% of numerical points should be missing. Now, the anomaly detector provides its service through an exposed API. So it monitors for anomalies in streaming data in real time using past trends to determine what is considered abnormal. As data is created, it can call the Anomaly Detector API on the fly, meaning monitoring happens virtually instantaneously. So as an alternative for historical data analysis or any business reason for not using real-time analysis, data can be provided as a batch for determining what anomalies might exist in data that has already been created. Now, trend changes can be identified by highlighting subtle change points in the data when it is provided as a batch processing effort to Anomaly Detector. Now, additional information about the data can be surfaced by Anomaly Detection as well, like expected values where there are none, and boundaries and positions of anomalies, and a list of observations relating to the data. When data is made available to Anomaly Detector, it will automatically create boundaries. However, these can be adjusted to provide a better fit to your data needs. The Anomaly Detector API is available as a RESTful web service, easily called by almost any modern programming language. It uses simple HTTP requests and JSON files for data creation and highlighting, making it universally adoptable across any platform. Now, the client library is also available for building your own apps in C-Sharp using the .NET Core framework 
or JavaScript through Node.js, or in Python 3 with the Pandas Data Analysis Library. So the client library allows your apps to detect anomalies in the data either in real time or as a batch deposit. It can detect the status of the most recent data points to determine if there are any anomalies. And it can detect trend changes within the data set, highlighting points in time when the trend started to emerge. Now the REST API is used by applications to make calls to the anomaly detector web service using JSON formatted data and retrieves the response for use by your app. So the operation to find anomalies in data generates a model using the entire series. So points before and after are used to determine what is an anomaly and the detector provides an overall status of the time series. The status determination feature generates a model using historical points to determine whether the current point is anomaly. And trend detection uses the entire series for the model and determines whether a trend emerged based on points before and after a window. Anomalies passed as JSON files, while human readable, are difficult to interpret in a batch. So Power BI Desktop can be used as a way to visualize anomalies and trends determined by Anomaly Detector. So Power BI Desktop can use its built-in queries to integrate with the Anomaly Detector API, enabling it to send and receive data. Using the data it receives back from the Anomaly Detector, it can provide rich visual representations of anomalies and trends. In this video, we're going to talk about navigating the Azure Anomaly Detector service. So up on my screen, I'm already logged in to portal.azure.com, and I'm just at the main splash page. If you don't already have a cognitive services deployed, you just need to go ahead and deploy one. We're going to start this video with an existing cognitive services service here. I'm just going to open this up. It's called AI 900 AD. Now. The Azure Anomaly Detector Service is an artificial intelligence service used to embed anomaly detection capabilities within applications for live detection or used for historical analysis of data to determine trend changes and really when anomalies are occurring or have occurred. Under Resource Management section, by default, the Quick Start is selected when I first arrive here. So the quick start guide has a series of steps to guide you through initiating a project to use the anomaly detector service. But really the first step is all around the API key. And that API key authenticates your application and allows it to start sending data to the service. Just gonna scroll a little bit here to get to the second step here. Put it in plain view. So the second step links you to the API console. Now this is a demo environment for trying out the anomaly detector APIs directly in the console without having to code an application to use it. Think of it as a developer environment that comes complete with demo data. And the third step. So this third step leads you to make a web API call and links you to where you can find some quick start code for applications written in c -sharp, Python, and JavaScript to integrate them with the Anomaly Detector service. Now for organizations who have strict controls around their data sovereignty, the Anomaly Detector service is also offered on-premise as a downloadable Docker container image. I'm now going to move to the section Keys and Endpoint under Resource Management. The Endpoint is the URL for your instance that will be used by your app to connect, and the keys are the keys used for authentication to the API. Now, as noted, there are two keys presented. Only one is used at a time, with the other acting as a failover when regenerating one, so that service is not disconnected and security can be assured. Let's go ahead now and take a look at the pricing tier. I'm going to click pricing tier under resource management. 
The cost of running Anomaly Detector is based on how many transactions you intend to execute. So the free instance has a hard limit of 20,000 transactions per month. A transaction is defined as an API call with a payload size of up to 1,000 data points, and each increment will count as one transaction. So the standard version comes with a cost per 1,000 transactions executed. And you can switch between pricing tiers by selecting the other option and clicking Select. Now, I'm going to click on Networking under Resource Management. Access can be controlled using virtual networks and endpoints. The default option is that it will be available to all networks, which makes it a target for abuse from the internet. So this should be changed after deployment to match your needs. Now, private endpoints are supported for secure connections for organizations that are unwilling to allow public IPs through their firewalls. I'm going to move on to Identity section under Resource Management next. Azure AI services support system-assigned managed identities, allowing developers easy, secure access to other Azure services like storage accounts. The Anomaly Detector service provided by Azure is a powerful AI tool with an easy to access interface accessibly through a simple endpoint and authentication key method. And we'll go to properties next under resource management. Properties allows us to see all the different pricing tiers, confirm the subscription name that this resource is using, the resource group and the resource ID. And finally, just under the locks section, under resource management, you can apply resource locks. So you can add individual or you can lock a resource group or lock a subscription. Clicking on the add button, you can specify a name and specify the lock type being read only or delete. These again are additional options. If other folks are accessing this resource, it may be beneficial if you do apply locks to add some notes so that others can know what this lock is about or what it's doing. In this video, we're going to talk about creating an Azure Anomaly Detection Service project in Visual Studio. Now, Microsoft has provided a series of client libraries to enable developers to quickly and easily create new projects to interact with the Azure Anomaly Detector service. Now, there are client libraries available for C Sharp projects utilizing the .NET Core framework, JavaScript using Node.js, and Python 3.x using the Pandas Data Analysis Library. In this demo, I'll go through creating a basic console app to connect to and interact with the anomaly detector using C Sharp and the Microsoft.Azure.CognitiveServices.AnomalyDetector NuGet package. So I'm just going to open up Visual Studio 2019 now. And when the splash page arrives, I'm going to click on Create a New Project. And I'm interested in creating a C Sharp .NET Core project. So I'll go ahead and select this. It's actually the first available option in my case. Go ahead and click on Next. And for here, I'm just going to call this Anomaly Detector Test. create and Visual Studio will go to work on preparing the default code project for this. We'll just give it a moment. Looks like we're just about ready here. What we need to do now is install the NuGet package that offers the C Sharp client library for connecting to the service. So on the Solution Explorer window, if it's not up, go ahead and view it. And what you want to do is right click over top your project. 
and find in the flyout menu Manage NuGet Packages. I'm going to go ahead and click on that, and the NuGet Package Manager screen in Visual Studio will appear. By default, it'll select whatever is currently installed by the project. As we just deployed this as a new project, there are no current packages available. So what we need to do now is search for some. So I'm going to click on Browse. And then in the search, I'm going to actually, just while Microsoft.json is being displayed, I actually do want that. I'm going to click on Install. The reason I'm doing that is because chances are I'm going to have to serialize and deserialize data to and from the anomaly detector and the Newtonsoft JSON framework or the Microsoft framework for JSON is a great way to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and use the Newtonsoft.json. Now in the browse, I'm going to search for Microsoft and .azure, .cognitive, services, anomaly, detector. I'll just give it a moment to do search. There we go. And I can see we're sitting here at version one. So I'll go ahead and click install on this. Now in my configuration, I'm not running a service fabric here. So to get around that, I'm going to click on tools. And I'm showing this because this is quite common. So clicking on tools in Visual Studio, NuGet Package Manager. And we're looking for the sub item Package Manager Settings. When you get into here, into the screen of the options, under NuGet Package Manager, click on Package Sources. And you want to uncheck the Microsoft Azure Service Fabric SDK if you have this running. And now I'm going to click on Install on the Microsoft Azure Cognitive Services Anomaly Detector one more time. And I should have success this time. And it'll just take a moment to install. I accept all these dependencies and licenses. All right, we look like we're in good shape now. Just going to go ahead and open up the program.cs and look to modify some of this code. For time reasons in this video, I'm just going to go ahead and paste code in and then just explain it. So the first thing I'm going to do is paste in all my directives. So using system, system IO, but most importantly, using Microsoft.Azure.CognitiveServices.AnomalyDetector and AnomalyDetector.Models. I'm going to add some code in here now, which will turn these ones from gray, which means that they're not used in the code below, to black, which means that they are used in the code below. So I'm going to come into my main method here now and do some replacements. And I'm just going to replace, or basically, load the endpoint and the key. So string, say endpoint, and I'll just put an empty string for now, and then string key, and empty string for now. What I want to do now is get those endpoints and API authentication key from my already deployed resource in the Azure portal. So I'm going to open up my portal.azure.com, and I already have a cognitive service set up. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And under resource management is keys and endpoint. I will go and click on that. Although only one key is used at a time in your app to access the service, two are provided because they should be treated like a password and cycled periodically to ensure there is no unwanted access using it. The second key is used as a failover, so service does not get discontinued when you regenerate one of the keys. So the endpoint, I'm going to start with that. I'm going to copy this to the clipboard. There's a little button that says copy to clipboard on its tooltip. So go ahead and do that. And then I'm going to go back to Visual Studio. And I'm going to paste this in as my endpoint variable. And then I'm going to come back and grab key one. And do the same kind of thing. Use a little button, copy to the clipboard and come back to Visual Studio, 
and paste this in as my key. So basically the endpoint is a URL and the key is a alphanumeric string. Now the framework can be used to build a client using the anomaly detector client object and then authenticate the client using the API key service client credentials class. It then contains an asynchronous method to analyze the entered data range as a batch for anomalies. The alternative is to use the last point detection, which uses historical data to determine if the newest point is anomalous. Now to create the client, we're gonna create a new method and use the API key service client credentials object with our key to call the endpoint and key defined earlier to create the anomaly detector client object. So again, for time efficiency, I'm just gonna go ahead and paste this, let's call it a function in here. There we go, make sure this resolves. So I can see the I anomaly detector client just based on the Visual Studio IntelliSense is correctly resolving. So we're in a console app here, so I'm calling it static. And I have my endpoint and key. So to call this from the main function, right, it would just be create client and then pass the endpoint and the key in as parameters. So that's it, basically. From here, I can, I'll just put a comment in my source here, do more things, basically. So at this point, the project is set up to act as a client and authenticate against the anomaly detector service. I can create new methods to load the data and use the framework to determine the approach to identifying where the anomalies lie in your data set or whatever basically I need to do. But this is the simple scaffolding that you need uh, to use. In this video, we're going to talk about integrating a time series data. Now, Azure Anomaly Detector Service provides a variety of machine learning algorithms exposed through a RESTful API for developers to utilize to determine anomalies in time series data without any requirement to be a data scientist. Now, the data must be formatted in a JSON document and have various attributes attached to fine tune the detector's algorithm and accelerate the API's response time while ensuring its findings are meaningful and within the organization's parameters. So what we're gonna do is open up a sample file. It's gonna be a JSON file. Let me go ahead and open it up here for you. All right, so this is a sample file from Microsoft and it shows data points taken every 24 hours. The granularity is defined as an attribute in the file as daily. So let's now look at the hourly. So I have two tabs open up in Notepad++. This is the daily, and now I'm going to switch to the hourly. Scroll all the way back up to the top here. So again, this sample has a value taken hourly. And the period attribute at the beginning of the file defines a seasonal pattern within the data. So every 24 data points will denote a sequence or pattern that restarts after the 24th point. And again, these are free files, of course, to view on your own. Now I have Visual Studio Code open here. I'm gonna switch over to this. This anomaly detector master can be found right on GitHub. It's a free app that discloses all this code that you can use to practice with. So let me go ahead and scroll up here. And I'm gonna start right here on the main program, starting on line 23, because this is when you do pull down that GitHub repo. This is the first line that you're basically gonna edit, which is the data path. Now, when passing data to the anomaly detector, again, you have to specify the data file and a URI to append to the service endpoint to create the request URLs used by the API. 
The next variable which you're going to have to swap out here is the last point detection URL. And it's used in streaming data situations where the data of previous points in the series is used to determine whether the last point delivered to the anomaly detector is in fact an anomaly. Next one is batch detection URL. So batch detection uses the entire series to generate a model. All points in the time series are considered and the points before and after a certain point are what is used to determine whether it is an anomaly. So this is used for assessing events that have already happened. Now there's also a third URL available, which is for finding change points in a series used to determine where trend changes occurred. I'm just gonna come down a little bit here now into the detect anomalies batch process and take a look at this section of code here. I'm just gonna highlight this is the construct of the request. The idea here is once you have read in the data, you can construct a variable that will be the request that calls in the variables defined previously to determine the endpoint. So URL for the type of analysis. Now in this case, batch detection the subscription key, and the data being pushed to the anomaly detector service. And just come down a little farther here as we can continue to trace the code. Focusing starting on line 55 here. So the JSON object returned from the anomaly detector API requires deserialization, which can be provided by the Newtonsoft JSON converter framework. Now the result will either be failed detection, or it results showing all the anomalies found. And you can visualize these using external libraries or just print a list of data points determined to be anomalous. Moving down now, a little farther here, going to look at the detect anomalies latest function. So detecting anomalies in the latest data point functions slightly differently because it is streaming. It will deserialize the JSON return and print the result, which would return the expected value based on the model. Is anomaly variable is true or false? And then we have is negative anomaly true or false? And then we have the is positive anomaly true or false? And some other information related to boundaries. And you could write a function to log these results externally write them to a database, or to simply count the number of true results. All right, so continuing on here, starting at the detect change points function here. Detecting the change point where a trend begins work very similarly to the batch analysis, where the anomaly detector returns a list of data positions. It uses a different algorithm to determine the results. So the heavy lifting is done in the back end with little requirement put onto the developer to determine and expose the results. Within the request itself, I have my change point detection URL. And again, I mentioned that we're using the Newtonsoft JSON library. So once I deserialize any of these objects, then I have full access to all the individual parameters. Right? And that's the case with all these. So every time we're into one of these functions, detect anomalous latest that we looked at you know, earlier. Again, we're deserializing every object and then this base system or this base function will write out the current object, but it's expected that you would do something with these. In this video, we're gonna talk about training a best fitting detection model. Now, the anomaly detection process can either be played against historical data as a batch process, finding anomalies within a defined window of time as determined by the data set, or as a streaming process that determines if the last point received was an anomaly based on previous points within the stream. So the message returned to the application connecting to the anomaly detector comes with the anomaly results, the data points expected value, 
and the boundaries used within the detection process. So these boundaries can be fine-tuned to make the detector fit within the organization's required parameters. So taking a step back, training the model to provide meaningful results depends entirely on the data presented and the options implemented. So data provided to the anomaly detector must be formatted as a JSON request object with a minimum of 12 data points and a maximum of 8,640 per window analyzed. Now, I've downloaded two sample data sets provided by Microsoft to demonstrate the data format required by the anomaly detector. So I have the sample daily and the sample hourly. Let me go ahead and open up sample daily in Notepad++. I use Notepad++ because it does easy formatting of JSON and does good color coding and those kind of things. Now, best practices from Microsoft specify that the time series should be separated by the same interval with no more than 10% of the points missing between the first and the final points. Now, in this time series, the data points are separated by a full 24 hours. The granularity defined is daily at the beginning of the file. Now, this can be daily, hourly, by the minute or called minutely, monthly, weekly, or even yearly. Now, for non-standard intervals, you can use the custom interval attribute to specify the intervals. So, for example, every five minutes would have by the minute or minutely, as they call it, as the granularity within a custom interval of five. I'm gonna now open up the other file. This was the daily file. I'm now gonna open up the sample hourly.json file. Again, I'm gonna view this through Notepad++. So this data set has a value taken every hour. In this case, starting right here on this current timestamp of 9 p.m. on December 2014. So that reads year 2014 hyphen month 12 hyphen and this is 07 here. So this is December 7th. And then timestamp 21. So 9 p.m. Now notice that it starts with a period, not the granularity. So a period can be specified to data sets that have seasonal patterns to improve the API response time and the accuracy of the results. So the period specifies the number of data points that elapse before the period repeats itself. So for this sample, the data points are taken hourly. So the period is set to 24. So the pattern repeats itself once per day, starting at 9 p.m. So if I scroll down here, I'm going to see this cycle every 24 repeat itself. Okay, we can see this doing it. So best practice states you should provide at least four periods worth of data points and an extra data point if possible. What I'll do now is scroll to the very bottom of this file just to get a look at the very, very last entry here and just see how this JSON file ends. So here is the granularity at the very bottom. So the last three lines of code. So the granularity is defined as hourly, as expected, of course. And there is also an integer for the sensitivity. So the sensitivity right now is 99. This is the level of statistical confidence required by the anomaly detector before it raises an alert to a data point that it is identified as being an anomaly. 
The higher the sensitivity integer, the more alerts will be generated. It will narrow the field of what it determines to be data out of expected range. A lower sensitivity number will result in fewer alerts as the range of acceptable values is extended. And finally, the max anomaly ratio is an optional mechanism to limit the candidates determined to be anomalous to those that are the best candidates. So it acts as a ratio of the overall data points in the same. So a sample of 200 data points with a ratio set to, let's say, 0 0.1, will return a maximum of 20 data points as being identified as anomalies. In this video, we're going to talk about deploying anomaly detector as a service. And we're going to do this through the lens of Visual Studio. Now, deployment of the anomaly detector service can be done through the Azure portal via the Azure CLI or using the client libraries for C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, or Python, or through an ARM template. So lots of options here. Now, in this demo, I will go over deploying the service through a C Sharp client app using the client library delivered as a NuGet package. So I have Visual Studio 2019 opened, and I'm going to start by creating a new project. And for the language, I'll keep it just C Sharp. And the options here, I'm going to choose just a console app is fine, .NET Core. I'll select that, go ahead and click Next. Now for the project name, I'll just give it a name that's going to work for me. Call it ad hyphen deploy hyphen client hyphen test. And that should be good enough. I'll go ahead and click on create. Visual Studio will give me the scaffolding here and automatically open up my program.cs file. So one of the very first things I need to do here is open up my NuGet package manager and add the required libraries. With the solution explorer open. I'm going to right click on my project name. In my case here, it's AD Deploy Client Test. When I right click, I'll get my context menu and I'm going to click on Manage NuGet Packages. Now, this will pop up with installed selected by default. And what I want to do is browse because I want to find new packages here. So I'm going to search for Microsoft. dot azure dot management dot cognitive services and there we go so i'm going to select in the list it's currently version 7.0 and i'm going to go ahead and click on the install now the reason i search for this is because the anomaly detector falls under the cognitive services category. So management for it is built into that client library. All right, there is some licenses that I have to accept here. Quite a few of them. I'll just click on I accept. And we'll let Visual Studio go to work. And this looks like it is now installed correctly can validate this by expanding dependencies within my Solution Explorer, then expanding packages, and confirm that my Cognitive Services version 7 is now installed. Now, while I still have NuGet Package Manager open, I'm going to look for the Azure Management Fluent libraries to provide some basic functions like authentication, the ability to specify subscriptions and properties for Azure resources. So I thought I would do this just as a quick FYI here. So I'm going to search for Microsoft.Azure.Management and we'll get Fluent first. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. So Microsoft.Azure.Management.Fluent. It's currently version 1.36.1. Go ahead and install that. 
And I'll just wait for this to install. And then I'm going to look for the resource manager. More licenses to accept. I'll click on I accept. All right. So now I'm going to search for Microsoft.Azure.Management and Resource Manager.Fluent. Okay. And same kind of thing here. It's version 1.36.1. .1. Same version level here. And accept that license. And I think this is enough now to start building some code here. I'm going to open program.cs and up in my using section, I'm just going to paste some code in here. And the main pieces I want to show here or highlight is the packages that I just installed. So Microsoft Azure dot management fluent resource manager dot fluent resource manager dot fluent dot authentication and then management dot cognitive services cognitive services dot model. So these are the using or basically the namespaces that are required here for what I'm about to do. So to execute the application there will be some prerequisite steps to take. You will need to create an Azure service principle that will be used to identify and authenticate the app. You will also need to make an Azure resource group for the anomaly detector to reside in. So just as a best practice, if I was doing this in a console app like I'm doing, I'm just going to go ahead and create those variables that I need. All right, so service principle for the app registration, one with the secret or cert location, the Azure subscription ID, my Azure AD or tenant ID, and my resource group name. So I'd want to create those variables. All right, so now the real work here is going to be in the console app. Of course, it's the main function, but it doesn't have to be. It can be another project type. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and paste some code here. So the first thing I'm going to do is create my service principal login information. And then from there, I can specify my client ID and my client secret. Notice that I'm using the first two variables that I created as my constant or global strings. Okay, so after I have that, paste the next segment of code. So. What I'm doing here now is calling my instance of the anomaly detector. I'm just going to scroll over here so I can see everything. Actually, I'm just going to do a carriage return here. There, now I can see the full path here. So I got var credentials and the SDK context dot Azure credentials factory dot from service principal. And I'm specifying now again my service principal application ID, which is the service principal for the app registration. Pass in the secret or the cert location. Now I'm also passing in my tenant ID and I'm specifying the Azure environment or the type of environment. I then create my cognitive services management client object. So in this case here, I just called it client. And as parameters, I pass in the credentials that I just created. I then specify the subscription ID as an attribute of this client object. Now, you can consult the Azure documentation to determine the kind or which is the function within the Cognitive Services product branch and the available SKUs, which are used to determine limits and pricing of the service. So just kind of make sure you do that kind of housekeeping before you get too far into this. I'm going to now create a function here outside of main. So another function. And this is all around creating a resource. So as one of the parameters, it's going to be the cognitive services management client, which is going to take in as an argument, basically the object that I just made, the resource name, the kind of string, the account tier, and the string location. So once I get into here, into the actual function, I can then use the object cognitive services account 
use the parameters here uh, just to mimic kind of what Microsoft does here. Let me just do a carriage return so we can see everything here. And what I then say is a new cognitive services account. And in that cognitive services account, it's going to go ahead and use IntelliSense here. So I can see all the different types of parameters. And again, this is where you want to use the documentation here. So I'm just going to pass null for the E tag and the string here. But I do have, for example, like the kind, the location, the resource name. And then another parameter is the cognitive services account properties and the new SKU passed in the account tier. This is all about billing. Okay, and then from the results there, I can say uh, clients, again, which is a parameter passed in, accounts.create, and then I create it as the resource group name that I pass in, specify the account tier, and the parameters that I just made in the previous line here. So if I wanted to, let me show you an example of how it actually invoke that. So back in the main project here, or the main function, I would call something like this. So create resource, the client, which is the cognitive services management client. And then the name of my resource, anomaly detector, S0, and East US, which would be like the location. So this is covering the client, the resource name, the kind, the account tier, and the location. So with this basic application, I can now rapidly deploy the anomaly detector service programmatically, allowing for pipeline delivery of results when I need the detector API to work through defined sets of time series data, for example. In this video, we're gonna talk about testing and evaluating the detection service. So I have open here, in this case, westus2.dev.cognitive.microsoft.com slash docs slash services slash anomaly detector slash operations slash post time series last detect each word separated by hyphens. Now, the anomaly detector service uses a generic framework entirely hidden from the developer's view to determine the algorithm that best matches the input data. So this helps to remove any necessity for the developer to be a data scientist, for example, but still provides meaningful data that can be customized to work within the organization's desired parameters. So Microsoft hosts an API reference tool under their cognitive services umbrella that is used to try out the exposed APIs of their services without having to first build an application. It acts as a hosted front end that connects to the customer deployed instance of the application. So the anomaly detector references operations for all three of the anomaly detector service APIs. So first, it can detect whether the last point is an anomaly using all the points before it. This is best used for a streaming service where points are being fed to the API live. So when a point is provided, it is analyzed and a result returned. It can find anomalies within an entire time series using a batch operation as the second option. This can be fine-tuned to adjust the parameters to the desired output. It uses the values before and after a point to determine if it is anomalous. And third, the service can also be used to determine trend changes within a data set, identifying the first point where the metrics would have begun moving to their newest normal state. So with all that said, I'm going to demonstrate how this request works and the result provided, which can be used by a developer to test the API and evaluate the information returned for how their application will integrate with it. So I will be starting with the algorithm for determining the status of the last point provided to the API. This is a static data set, but an application produces a metric at a regular cadence could utilize the RESTful API to provide live metrics to the service. So I will now click the button 
Open API Testing Console on the site provided by Microsoft. And now I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. So the first thing you want to do is specify your own instance of Azure Anomaly Detector. So I'm going to click the drop down under Host, and I will change it to the fill in the blank resource name dot cognitive services dot azure dot com. Now, once I do that, I can supply a name that I have. So if I open up portal.azure.com, I have deployed a cognitive service. Its name is AI-900-AD. So I'll now place this name into the resource. So AI-900-AD. Now the other variable required is the API key our resource uses for authentication. And if I scroll down a little bit to the header section here, I can see a red exclamation, OCP hyphen APIM hyphen subscription hyphen key. This is where I need to actually place this. So I'm going to go back to my other tab into the Azure portal. I'm going to open up the cognitive services. In my case, it's the AI hyphen 900 hyphen AD. Under resource management section, there is a clickable link called keys and endpoints. This is where I need to extract my key. So there are two keys here. I'm going to take the first key or key one. There's a button for copying it to the clipboard. I'm going to do that. I will now go back to my other tab and I will paste this key as the value into this text box here. And if I need to actually view it, I can toggle the show hide if I want to actually confirm what the number is. All right, so now this is filled out. I'll draw your attention now as I scroll to the request body. So I can see the request body, which is the time series data in JSON format. I can see timestamps and values. And I can scroll all the way to the bottom of this particular window here. And I can see the max anomaly ratio, the sensitivity, and the granularity settings here. So if I wanted to, I could edit these and manipulate this to do some fine tuning. Now the max anomaly ratio and sensitivity can be adjusted to match your organization's requirements. So with the request URL automatically being populated, as I can see in the next section here, as I'm just highlighting, I can confirm that this is correct. HTTPS colon slash slash, and my name that I've placed in above, AI hyphen 900 hyphen AD, and then cognitive services, anomaly detector, etc. here. So if I continue to scroll, I'm going to see the HTTP request that will be made once I reach the bottom here. So in this body here, I can get the entire series. I'm just going to scroll past this because I do want to execute this. So I have to scroll all the way to the bottom. All right, and there is a send button. I will now go ahead and click on that. Now, further down here, I have a response status of 200. That is an HTTP response that the API returned, which means success. I can also see the response latency, in this case of 406 milliseconds. So data tuning can help to reduce latency and Microsoft have references to best practices for this. I'm going to continue to scroll here to the new section of our response content. It shows the expected value of the last data point based on historical records and determines whether it is an anomaly or not. It will also identify whether it is a negative or positive anomaly and give you some additional information around the data. So changing the anomaly ratio, sensitivity, and adding boundaries can return different results. So this can be used for testing and evaluating the service to determine if it fits your organizational requirements and for finding best fits for data to get meaningful results.
and this video, we're going to talk about customizing the anomaly detection service. So I have Chrome opened here, and I'm at the following URL. It's spelled A L G O E V A L U A T I O N. So A L G O Evaluation dot Azure Websites dot net. The Azure Anomaly Detector Service from Microsoft is used to detect anomalies in time series data, automatically determining the best model to apply to the data. So this automation extends to determining the boundaries for expected values and anomaly identification. However, though it is an automated service, there are user configurable parameters that can be applied to the data to ensure it meets the organization's requirements. So I'll be using the Anomaly Detector interactive demo to perform some test runs against my deployed instance of the Anomaly Detector. So on this website that I referenced, there is a sample one button. I'm gonna go ahead now and click this. So sample one provides the last point detection where it compares the point currently under scrutiny with the points prior to it to determine if it is an anomaly. So this is used for streaming apps for live feedback on the current point. Now the sensitivity, it's going to scroll down here a little bit here so we can look at the sensitivity and some of these sliding Sliding UI here. So the sensitivity is the level of statistical confidence required by the anomaly detector before it raises an alert on a data point that it is identified as being an anomaly. So the higher the sensitivity integer, the more data points that will be identified as anomalies. Now it will narrow the field of what it determines to be data out of expected range. So in contrast, a lower sensitivity number will result in few alerts as the range of acceptable values is extended. Now, the max detecting window is used to calculate whether the current point is an anomaly by setting the number of prior points the model should use in its comparative calculation. And just another piece of information around this, the max anomaly ratio is an optional mechanism and it just limits the data points determined to be anomalous to those that are best candidates. It acts as a ratio of the overall data points in the time series data set. So for example, a data set comprising of 200 data points with a ratio set to say 0 0.1 will return at maximum the first 20 data points that were identified as anomalies. I'm gonna scroll all the way back up to the top here. And there is a status just at the top of the graph, and there is a start button. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on start. I'm going to let this run to maybe around, say, 920, and then take a look here. So I'm going to go ahead now and click on start. I just got to fill in my key. Actually, this is a great point here. So notice on the API key section here, there's an endpoint and a key. So for the endpoint, I'm going to replace this West US2 with my own value, and it's going to be called AI-900 AD. And then it's going to be, I'm going to remove this API, it's going to be cognitive services.azure.com. And the key, let me just go get it here. So where I'm getting it, if I go to my portal.azure.com and I open up my cognitive services resource, mine in particular here is called AI-900-AD. When I open the resource, under resource management, there is the section called keys and endpoints. So I'll go ahead and click on that. Notice my endpoint here, AI-900-AD, Cognitive Services. This is the value that I just changed a moment ago. If I click on Copy to Clipboard, 
I could have just pasted it right in here, which I'll do just to make sure there's no typos or spelling errors or anything like that. And then back on the Azure portal, I have two keys. I'll copy key one to the clipboard and come back and paste this key in the key field. And now this will target my cognitive services Azure resource. Go ahead and click on start. And as I said, I'll let this run just a little while here, maybe till it gets to around the 920 mark, and then I'll stop it. So I can see the graph, move it along, selecting. This is looking great. Let it continue on. And it's about time to stop it now. So now I've gone ahead and stopped it. Now, this is the fun part here. We get to look at the anomalies. In the graph, we're going to see two red circles. These are the anomalies. So there's one anomaly. And if I put my mouse over it, I can get a tooltip. I just have to hold it just kind of right here. Start it again here. I'll just stop it. All right. So if I hover over this, I can see a tooltip. And it basically tells me in August 28th of 2018, this is an anomaly, has an expected value, shows me a delta, shows me a min period. And I can go to the first anomaly, which happened very close to the second anomaly here. And I can see different delta values different expected values. Now here's the interesting part here. Modifying, say, the max detecting window, it can be done and then I can rerun these same type of parameters here. That's the very cool feature here. So I can alternate the sensitivity, the max detecting window, and the max anomaly ratio, and then continue on and look for, again, look for that data. Remember, on the max detecting window, right now it's set to 28, but a higher number of points will generally provide more accurate results if the data set does not have obvious anomalies like, the, say, this one does. So I'm going to take this window, max detecting window, and I'm going to drag it all the way to the right. That puts me at a value now of 56. Now with that set there, I can scroll the way back up and I can just continue on and it'll go ahead and use the new values. Notice it moving along here now. And we can see lots of anomalies now. I'm just going to go ahead and click on stop. So I can see several anomalies popping out up here around 10.07.2018, 10.05.2018, very, very close in the dates. All right, so let's now take a look at sample two. So above the graph here, there's a second sample. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And we'll look at some more data here. So I think what we'll do, the max detecting window on sample two is set all the way to the right already at 672. The sensitivity is set to 70, and the max anomaly ratio is 0 0.25. I think this is actually a pretty good starting point. So let's go ahead now and click the start. And again, I'm not going to let this run for too long here, but we'll just go ahead and start it. And let's get some data here. What we need to understand here is the blue highlighted area is the boundaries defined by the sensitivity setting. So you can see over on the far right of the graph, there's going to be a sudden appearance of anomalies here, way over here. I can hover over it with my tooltip. And I can see one second here. It's a little tricky to get the tooltip here, but I can see that the value is roughly 14.18, but it goes outside the boundary. Now, lowering the sensitivity will increase the boundary size. So notice that I've stopped it now. So we had a value of 70. So what I'm going to do now is, let's say, let's drag the sensitivity slider to 10. 
So we're at 70. I'm going to drag it all the way down here to 10. There we go. And actually, I need to restart this here because I've my graph's already set, so let me go ahead and stop this. There, just refresh my page. Let me go back into sample two. And let me start off this down at 10 sensitivity. And now we'll start. Okay, then I get my current series here, and I can see it move along. Now, I can speed this up. So if I want to see more specifics about this top right, I can click anywhere on here and move it over, and it's now running with the new sensitivity. Okay, so I'll just give this a minute to go. Maybe I'll just move it a little farther over here, just for the purpose of just being time efficient here. So again, it's going now with a sensitivity of 10. And it's climbing up here to the Anomalies that we've been looking at in the very top right. Yeah, it looks like we're almost closed out here. All right. So now I can see the deltas here, the min period. And if I want, I can slide this back and move the sensitivity all the way, say, to the max value. I mean, like, say, 95 here. And I'm going to stop, and then I'm going to start it again here. All right, so now I'm viewing this with a sensitivity of 95. So many more anomalies have been identified here as we move this up. So if I actually start looking at all the anomalous points, it's a lot now. So in the previous graph, we had those little red circles. It's just a little harder to see here. You actually have to run your tooltip right over it. But we're getting a lot more anomalies at this point. First anomalous point up here. There we go. Okay. So now we can see this one here, which we wouldn't have got at a lower sensitivity. We didn't see it appear anyway on this. So we have one here now. Now let's. Be more creative here. Let's move the max anomaly ratio. And let's move it all the way left. Let's go 0 0.01. And let's restart this at that. All the way over here. And it's going to automatically start. When you click on the graph, it seems to actually automatically start here. So what we should now see with 0 0.01 max anomaly is a large reduction in the number of anomalies detected. So if I let this kind of all play out here, it'd have to catch up here basically to this one over this previous anomaly. It's going to find a lot less basically at this point. Now, when you're preparing your data, these configuration items, repeat that timestamp 1355 for the audio. Now, when you are preparing your data, these configuration items can be specified in the JSON file to be sent with the request, or they can be omitted to use default settings. The parameters are optional, but can help your organization fine-tune their results to surface only meaningful data from the Anomaly Detector Service. So in this course, we've identified the uses of anomaly detection and work with the Azure Anomaly Detection Service. And we did this by exploring the anomaly detection and its challenges, Azure Anomaly Detector Cognitive Service and how to navigate, creating an Azure Anomaly Detection Service project, and integrating time series data into an Azure Anomaly Detection Service project. We also looked at training a best fitting detection model for the best reporting, deploying anomaly detection as a service, and testing, evaluating, and customizing the detection service. In our next course, we'll work with the Azure Natural Language Processing Services to handle language modeling for text-to-speech, 
speech-to-text, and translation.